It's a pleasure to, uh, to introduce the chair of our first panel this morning on visual and literary representation, and that is uh, Yale's own Paul Draghi. So Paul is a man who wears uh, many hats here. Uh, he currently works at, correct me if I have the, the exact kind of parameters, you can correct, uh, but is working in the office, in, in the dean's office at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, working on special projects. Uh, currently, uh, he works on and teaches about GIS mapping, along with many other things. But uh, he also has a very special connection to the Tibetan and Himalayan collections here at Yale, especially in the Beinecke. Back in the 90s, uh, he spent many, many years, long, long time, going through systematically all of the uh, Tibetan texts, the manuscripts, the block prints, as well as much of the artwork and the objects, uh, cataloging them and analyzing them. It's still, uh, he wrote back in, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, our best sort of analytical survey of the Tibetan and Himalayan uh, materials in, in the Beinecke. Um, and I have a special affinity for the work Paul has done uh, because he wrote uh, another early dissertation on Milarepa. And we just can't have too much Milarepa. Well. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn over the floor to Paul. Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, I'm really reminded of my academic background. I did my PhD at Indiana under initially um, Tipton Norbu, Taksa Rinpoche, and then Helmut Hoffman. But in Indiana, they never change the time uh, when it comes to daylight savings time. There's an actual law to that effect. And they consider the regular time to be God's time and daylight savings time to be national time, which they blamed on every president from Jefferson to Franklin Roosevelt and consider that only slightly more intrusive a regulation than federal income tax. So uh, <laughs> I'm particularly reminded of that today when I woke up at about 5.30 to drive down here. Uh, but I'm encouraged everyone is here and uh, showed up on time. Uh, you're, we're so happy to welcome you here to Yale. And I'm happy that you had a chance to see some things at the Beinecke. It's a remarkable collection with a tremendously bizarre uh, past, as most Tibetan collections tend to be. And the topic today, I think, is utterly fascinating. I don't really have a lot to say. I'm really more ornamental than functional, and I'm hoping just to moderate what's going to be said. But it, it's a really uh, critical issue, which is how we view ourselves as Tibetologists and uh, students of the Himalaya. and and also how we understand what people are expressing about their own values and, and selves through what we call their art, literature, and artifacts. And uh, to me, nothing could be more fascinating than this, partly because, as you all know, there is so much fiction, so much uh, going into the way we study about the Himalayan region. Part of this is the engine that drove us to do that, uh, many of us probably uh, had our initial contact with the Himalayan region through very popular forms, but uh, the more deeply we understand it, the more we understand the complexity of it. And uh, all I can say is that the most compelling part of it, when you boil it all down, is the remarkable authenticity and originality of it. And I think that's what we perhaps all share an appreciation of. Uh, my colleagues here today are Michael Hutt from uh, School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, Rob Lim is, would you like to, yep, uh, from Northwestern, Tsering Shakya. And our respondent is here. Great. Um, Mimi Yang Pruksoan from Yale. And uh, we occasionally pass in the art gallery, but haven't got a chance to talk. Um, Michael, are you prepared to sure. begin? Sure. Thank you very much. So good morning, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry to be speaking in national time and not in God's time, but I'm trying to make the best of it. And again, I'd like to add my thanks to to, uh, to Sarah and Andrew and Mark and Jacob and everybody for, for making making this happen. It's been It's been a real pleasure. Um, I've, try, I've addressed these, these questions in my own, my own particular way, and, uh, and I'm going to do kind of three things. One is, uh, briefly, just to talk about the way in which um, my own teaching has kind of evolved, um, and to talk about the way in which one approaches and represents certain, certain issues in the Himalaya. Uh, 
Um, a, a brief mention of what um, the late Martin Hofton many years ago uh, proposed to work on, which he, he called the, the Shangri-La syndrome, which I think um, has taken on a new dimension, obviously, in China more recently. And then, and then in a little in more, more, little more, more detail, um, I'm going to talk about some, some literature, uh, some Nepali literature I've been working on, um, and try and make some conclusions about uh, being on the same page, and I, I'll explain what I mean by that when I get to it. So I, I, th I was thinking back in, over the last you know, day or two about, about the way in which our scholarly engagement with the Himalaya has, has evolved um, in response to both perhaps our understandings and also kind of grand realities. Um, and thinking back to the early years of my own uh, career as a, as, a, as a lecturer at SOAS, which I I joined SOAS as a postdoc fellow, having been a student there, and uh, I joined in 1987, so sort of the last years of the Panchayat uh, regime. And I'd started teaching a, a course which I called Foundations of Nepali Culture, which was a, an undergraduate uh, sort of general introduction to Nepali cultural history, um, which would include a few, a few lectures on, on cultural and political history, um, some stuff on Hinduism and Buddhism in the Nepali context, uh, some stuff on, on Newad and, and Sherpa cultural identity, ne Newad ar architecture, language families, the Gurkha tradition, the posi position of women particularly in Balanchetri communities work, uh, drawing on, on Lynn Bennett's work, tourism literature, etc., etc. And these were, looking back now, I can see really quite essentializing narratives of, of what, what were then proposed as kind of fairly static identities and cultures, um, and also based on the assumption of uh, the existence of something that one could call Nepali culture. Um, since I've returned to teaching after a long period of, of, of being, being in academic management, um, I've been teaching a, mast a master's course, a graduate course, which I call Culture and Conflict in the Himalaya. Um, and this is much more focused on the post-1990 period, um, with all the other stuff as kind of context-setting material. So there's much more here on the, on the politicization and problematization problematization of ethnic and cultural identities um, and is also less confined by the boundaries of the Nepali nation state with lectures on Bhutan, Sikkim, the Gwadkalan movement and so on. And I was interested last year um, when I asked uh, students at the end of the, of the year whether it would have been useful to have had something on Kashmir in this course and I think one of the things that crossed my mind yesterday was the way in which uh, we haven't even mentioned I think Kashmir even though we've been talking about the Himalayas. Um, because the title, Culture and Conflict, you know, suggested to a few prospective students that we'd be looking at, at Kashmir, because uh, from an Indian perspective, you know, if you talk about culture and conflict in the Himalaya, they may, may think of Kashmir before they think of anything else. Um, but actually the students said no, they thought that Kashmir would have introduced a whole other uh, set of histories and arguments and, and issues um, and, and complicated the course perhaps unnecessarily, uh, whereas what we had done had been sort of within some kind of cultural continuum with a, a sort of Nepali uh, vein running, running through it. So I just think, just presenting those sort of be beginning of, of my own career and, and the latest stages, uh, and just sort of saying in terms of representations, uh, in terms of teaching about the Himalayas, there's a change here, and it's, it's perhaps to do perhaps with my own understandings, uh, perhaps to do with changing grand realities in, in the Himalaya itself. Uh, the second, second point I wanted to mention, again, uh, is the, the sort of Shangri-La syndrome, as I've, I've called it. And I think um, I, I was interested in this, and I think perhaps for many of us, <coughs> our engagement with the Himalaya begins with some kind of love or some kind of romance um, because uh, choosing to become a, a Himalayan specialist is not a particularly wise career move um, in terms of, of, of looking for appointments and jobs uh, in the academic market. Um, and therefore, I think there's, 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 in many of our engagements anyway, maybe I'm only speaking for myself, but I think there's, there's a love and there's a romance about, about this part of the world. It's, it's beautiful, it's, it has hero heroic locations, um, and, it's, and it's welcoming and a, pleasure, a, pleasure, a place that it's a pleasure to be in. Um, so I, I thought about this many years ago and, and talked and looked actually at Hilton's novel um, and wrote a piece called Looking for Shangri-La from Hilton to La Michane, which came out in 1996, um, in which I talk, uh, talked about the way Hilton had represented uh, Shangri-La and the way in which the, the kind of Shangri-La trope 
had been recycled in, in writings on particular places and the way it, in which it has kind of moved around. Um, if you go back to the National Geographic in the 1930s and 40s, you will see this invoked regularly in, in, in articles about the Kathmandu Valley, believe it or not. Um, whereas now, it, it, and then it moves around, it, you know, Lhasa, uh, uh, Chandler's unveiling of Lhasa book is, is, is you know, the kinds, of, the kinds of metaphors that are used um, are, are very, very redolent of the kind of Shangri-La syndrome. And I think it still, still hangs over us a little, um, perhaps mostly in, uh, in scholarship on, on the Tibetan-speaking world, and perhaps particularly with regard to Bhutan, where there is still... Uh, a kind of self-censorship in, in our scholarship that is quite similar to the kinds of things that we were talking about um, uh, in coverage of, of Nepal uh, during the Panchayat period. So that's, those are the kind of two small points, really. Um, and I think one thing that has struck me also um, is what we don't include in our representations and considerations of the Himalaya. Um, we have not had a single mention of Islam in the last three days, um, there are substantial Muslim communities in the Himalaya, not just in, in Kashmir. So perhaps, you know, our picturing, our imagining, our representation of the Himalaya still has these, these kind of emphasis on certain aspects of, of this, this part of the world's uh, cultural heritage and, and some exclusion going on here as well in our, in our imagining of, of this part of the world. Um, that's the first two points. The, the third one, I'll just a little, little bit longer uh, to talk about, um, which is my kind of home territory of modern Nepali literature. Uh, and I've been working for the last two or three years on, on more recent literature, sort of stuff that's come out since 2009, 2010, um, and noticed quite a radical change in, uh, in the, the literary environment, particularly in, in Kathmandu, since my earlier work in the 1990s. Um, and it's, I would date this change back to around 2005 and the publication of this uh, particular novel, Palpasa Cafe, which is a set in the conflict period, um, written by Narayan Wagle, who was then the editor of Kantipur, the leading Nepali language uh, daily newspaper, and was heavily marketed to the extent that within two years of its publication, it had sold something like 28,000 copies. Uh, and also had appeared in a, in a quite high-quality English translation. Um, and it was marketed very in interestingly and intelligently. Um, you, you probably can't read the, the small text there, but this was a, an advert for Palpasa Cafe um, that appeared regularly in, in a number of different uh, Nepali-language magazines, the kind of glossy news uh, magazines such as Nepal and so on, which are Nepali-language, but the advertising for Palpasa Cafe was almost entirely in English, even though the novel itself was in Nepali. So there was this kind of message that maybe you thought Nepali literature was this kind of fusty-dusty thing that only, only Brahmin men and Nawars and so on uh, wrote and read and talked about. But actually, if you're a, if you're a racy, uh, glossy Nepali language magazine buying kind of person, perhaps you should think about reading this kind of stuff too. And here's an advert that acknowledges that you can also read English. So it, it brings Nepali literature into the market in a way that it hadn't, hadn't been there before. And it's been followed by, uh, I mean, uh, this, these are my selections, um, and I've, I, I've talked about five particular novels in a, in, a, in a longer paper that I'll be presenting in Kathmandu in July, um, and in no particular order. The, these are books that have made uh, uh, quite a, an impact, at least in the Kathmandu kind of public sphere. Um, Karnali Blues by Bodhisattva uh, Chapain, uh, published about three years ago. Again, uh, widely discussed, widely reviewed, and widely, widely read by, by people in Kathmandu. Uh, it's a, a kind of au fictionalized autobiography of, of growing up in the Karnali zone during the, the conflict period, but based on a great deal of local detail with Taru culture uh, having quite a place in it. Um, Urgengo Ghora is a, another novel, uh, by, again from the same kind of period, by Yug Patak, which is a kind of magical realist telling of uh, a young Tamang woman's um, involvement in an insurgency uh, suspiciously similar to the Maoist insurgency in Nepal, in a place that's very, very obviously uh, designed to represent Nepal. Uh, 
um, with this um, motif of the of Urgen, uh, the for the king of the Tamangs who was killed by the Kuss uh, back in in the mist the mists of, of ancient time, uh, appearing to her in, in visions and images uh, through through the story. Again, very widely read, very widely discussed novel. Um, Narayan Dakar's Predkalpa, uh, The Time of the Dead, which is a, a novel about um, the return of a young Brahmin man from his education in, in Banaras at the beginning of the 20th century in, in, in a, a, what is clear, dis, dis, described very clearly, identified very clearly as uh, the northeast corner of the Kathmandu Valley with Chandra Shamsher Rana um, presiding over Nepal from, from, from Singha Darbar. Um, and the way in which he tries to introduce social reforms by um, taking in a Dalit boy and uh, making him into a Brahmin, um, by, um, by mar marrying a widow, so breaking a lot of the social conventions, and the way in which eventually he, is, he and his family are dispossessed and expelled from Nepal. So again, it's a, <coughs> it's a, a, a story of, of, of oppression, uh, revolt, uh, and, and, and banishment set in a, a historical past. Um, and then uh, <coughs> the final example is, is uh, Krishna Dharabasi's uh, novel Radha, which is a retelling of the, the Krishna Radha story uh, from the perspective of Radha herself, who in the kind of classical versions of the story, uh, as you probably know, dis more or less disappears, entirely disappears from, from the narrative um, after uh, Krishna leaves, uh, leaves Braj. Um, and and it, uh, so Krishna Dharabasi um, constructs this story in which um, a a trunk of um, steel of metal plates inscribed metal plates are discovered buried in the Tarai, uh, and a, a mysterious sadhu turns up who can read this ancient language, and it turns out to be Radha's autobiography, um, which he reads out to a huge crowd of people who assemble on the banks of this river in the East Tarai, um, and she is. She's feisty. She, she's 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 not taking any 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 nonsense from from Krishna. Uh, she's very critical of him. She has her own path and her own way, uh, and she rejects Krishna um, r regularly uh, and forges her own path as a pilgrim, as a as a revolutionary as well. Um, no, no time here to go into the detail of that. So, those are the. Those are the five books I've been I've been thinking about and, and, and writing about, and also to try to approach them in a in a as in a more sociological kind of manner than, than purely as literature, and think about what their significance and importance is in this time, uh, this sort of traditional time in Nepal, um, as we've moved from the from the conflict into perhaps maybe one day some kind of federal secular republic. And there are a number of, of features of these novels which I think are, are interesting. And in one, one I've uh, just to identify a few of them. One is the way in which they, they use, some of them, three of them at least, have used uh, have, have used the past as a position from which to critique the present. <coughs> so, Yugpata uh, goes back to the to the imagined Tamang mythical uh, past um, to mount a critique of, of ethnic exclusion. Um, in a, in a kind of a, this magical realist kind of way, um, that Aaron Dakar goes back to the beginning of the Rana regime to to write about um, the, the the oppressive um, conventions of of classical Hindu uh, society under the under the terms of the Mulaki Ayn, um, the Dalits, the position of women, and so on. Um, and Krishna Dharabasi again this paints this fable of of a, a liberated Rana uh, Radha. Um, and the way in which she forges her own her own destiny. So there's this use of the past, which is not not entirely a new feature of Nepali literature. It's been done before to some extent, but these seem to be much more much more nuanced and much more pointed uses of the past than we've seen seen before. There's also the question of the Maoist imprint, as I've called it. There's 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 a considerable impact on the Nepali cultural s sphere of the way in which Maoist ideology um, has been propagated through various means and the literature that, that, that Maoist cadres and others um, have produced, particularly in the form of, of memoirs, which I've, I've, I've published an article about quite recently. 
And one supposes that perhaps some of this, particularly perhaps the Urgengu Gora book, the, 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 the Tamang uh, legend, is bearing some examples, some signs of an influence of Maoist ideology here, because it, it, it is very, very Maoist in its, in its tone and, and, and content in many ways. Um, so one sees, sees this impact. Um, I think I'm probably a little short of time there, so I'll, I'll well. begin to wrap up. Um, there's also a question of location and perspective. Um, by and large, Nepali literature has been a Kathmandu-centric um, uh, a literature, but we see now increasingly uh, a perspective from outside the centre. So, a very successful novel set in the Karnali zone, um, and um, and also the Tamang perspective. So, again, a decentering, a decentralisation of it. And I think what's also interesting is um, one thing I will be criticised for probably when I present this in Kathmandu is the fact that these are all written by uh, Brahmin men. Um, and I make no particular apology for that because I base this on, uh, on, on circulation, popularity, and so on, rather than um, any, any other criteria because of, I'm interested in the impact they have. Um, and I was interested also to see that I looked at, Gla at Facebook um, to fi and found that Palpasa Cafe had 3,123 likes. Um, Kalanali Blues had 2,987 likes, um, whereas Urgengo Gora, Prade Kalpa, and uh, Radha had only, had only a few. So this is quite an interesting reflection of perhaps the demographic of, of people who are reading these particular novels. We have you know, an interface between Facebook and Nepali novels, which one could have barely imagined uh, 10, 15 years ago. But I think what's significant is that these guys, even though they are Brahmin men, uh, are talking about Janajati perspectives, are talking about uh, gendered perspectives and so on, which again is, is something one has not seen in Nepali literature until quite recently. So just to round off this, this discussion, um, a significant number of the people I've discussed these things with and interviewed in Kathmandu over the past few years, ranging from young Maoist cadres to, to public intellectuals, are aware of these novels. Many have read at least a few of them um, and, and all have opinions about them. So my question really is, is this. Um, how important is it for us non-Himalayan scholars, those of us who are non-Himalayan scholars, who seek to analyse and comment on political, social, cultural issues in this region, how important is it for us to be on the same page as our interlocutors in the sense that if vernacular literary and media production is an important part of the local discourse, um, what, what are we, what's going on if, if the foreign produced analysis and commentary doesn't take any account of it? Um, and if our, if our answer is that uh, the, the, the reason we can't engage perhaps with, with literature of this nature is, is because it requires um, you know, quite a few years of linguistic training in the first instance for, for somebody from outside this society, then that raises, for me at least, um, some questions about the kind of political economy of language-based, regionally focused scholarship in, in, the, in the wider sense. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This weekend I've, I've really been privileged to, um, to be brought behind the curtain as it were, to see uh, those I've, I've read uh, or will read. Um, but rarely uh, do I get to witness uh, anthropologists of the Himalaya, uh, literary people uh, with uh, political scientists and those studying the environment, uh, exchanging views. And it's, uh, I have more truck with uh, uh, religious studies specialists and uh, some more with uh, literature, but I don't go to to AAA, so it's been inspiring to see you uh, and to think about some of the issues that I think show up, um, uh, I hope, in uh, commonality with, uh, with my own work as, a, as an art historian and someone who, who does work um, in the, the western regions uh, of, um, of the Himalaya, um, th which has been somewhat less uh, as people have commented, uh, uh, somewhat less uh, 
well represented than, than Nepal and Tibet uh, and, um, and perhaps uh, Garhwal. Um, so I have been uh, quite literally uh, tried to, uh, to ask myself these, the questions that the, uh, that the organizers ask. Uh, what do we see when we look at the Himalaya? What kinds of strategies and techniques have people in the Himalaya used over time to represent themselves? their aspirations, beliefs, identities, etc. And as an art historian, I've taken that um, quite literally. Um, but I can only answer this best by translating it into the, the tiny corner of the Himalaya that, that I know best, and that's Zangskar. And so I'm hoping that in the, uh, yesterday, uh, several times, the issue of scale came up. And I'm hoping that in a way, um, this rather uh, limited, constrained look at a, at a particular area will perhaps provide some analogous um, avenues worth exploring in other regions, though certainly not universally valid principles. So just to remind you, uh, Zangskar, uh, uh, far um, to the west, actually uh, part of um, uh, Jammu and Kashmir state now politically, um, though that has a uh, historical uh, reference. And the, my focus is on the Zangskar Valley, which is a relatively um, small area of this. Um, it has many similarities, this um, constrained region, with other regions of both the Tibetan or, uh, in my opinion, Tibetanized um, Himalaya, and uh, also long-standing circuits of exchange with the non-Tibetan regions. Um, of the Himalaya, but it also has, you know, naturally distinct characteristics and historical experience. And just to give you a kind of sense of, of what the um, recognizable um, culture, it, of course it is both, uh, the, the economy is based on both agriculture and um, animal, animal herding. There's a really strong, um, uh, strong Buddhist um, part of the culture, at least uh, today. Uh, Islam is, is quite strong in certain areas, but most of the, of the villages outside a couple of towns are um, in the heart of Zangskar are Buddhist. There's a lot of um, everyday religion, ordinary uh, religion, um, both at, at Losar, the New Year's, as, and these, are, um, d these rituals are designed to you know, sort of cast out the obstacles, so they're very much, um, as Todd Lewis was talking about yesterday, uh, focused on practical, practical needs. Uh, very high altitude, some, some of the villages. Um, and so while it might seem isolated, you notice that uh, Lobzang is wearing a, a, a UN hat. Um, his son is a uh, uh, member of the Ladakhi Scouts um, unit, a regiment of the Indian Army that were recently posted in, in Lebanon as part of the, a UN unit. So um, although we might think of them as isolated, uh, perhaps uh, less so than we think, uh, still um, very much involved with a, with a hierarchy, uh, both in, in the villages and in the monasteries, um, that is uh, quite imp important. Another example of the, um, of the kind of very practical use of uh, Buddhist rituals, uh, there was a locust uh, invasion in 2006, and they invited uh, Lo Chantuku from Spiti to come really from Delhi, to come and perform a, a ritual to get rid of the grasshoppers, um, which, uh, they're, uh, which they, they succeeded in doing by uh, having a, a homa rite. Um, and one of the particularities, uh, of course, that has to do with um, uh, contemporary times uh, is the increasing prominence of nuns uh, in, in this area, um, to a certain extent Western supported. Um, but um, they have been uh, accepted uh, by the villages, and now a lot of, um, of the, the main village rituals are actually sponsored um, by nuns, which is interesting. Of course, it has a long history of um, artistic production, <coughs> which is, of course, my interest, though um, in the light of uh, Jeff's uh, comments yesterday about um, out-migration, especially of young people and education, uh, uh, that is also uh, often the tr true now for uh, artistic production. Uh, they, they're either acquiring things or uh, from Dharamsala or Ladakh. These people were, came in to finish what 
artists from uh, Dharamsala had uh, begun and not finished, so they brought people in from Ladakh. And so the local artistic um, uh, production is actually declining because of this, um, in a sense, out-migration of, of um, cultural resources. There, there are some amazing uh, local resources that, that uh, households outside of the monasteries, but householders have um, texts which were commissioned by their, um, by their ancestors uh, uh, several hundred uh, years ago. Uh, in one case, um, this one in particular, it's datable um, because of a reference to a king uh, in, in the uh, 17th century. And it seems that uh, these were, uh, they're quite different in content from the, uh, of course they overlap with, with productions that were produced in monasteries, but these lay compilation texts um, have uh, a great deal of um, sort of practical use. And one example is a veterinary text um, by uh, Drakpa Gelson that is aimed at um, healing uh, uh, diseased animals. So a lot of the, the, the ritual texts in these compilations are, um, again, ordinary religion and focused on producing um, immediate effects. Um, so that, that sort of um, as an introduction to the, uh, to the range of the areas that perhaps art, art history can uh, contribute to uh, wider studies, I want to focus now f uh, for a few minutes on the kinds of, uh, literally the kinds of strategies and techniques people have used to represent themselves. And the main um, way that we can uh, see people uh, representing themselves is uh, through um, uh, depictions of patrons, depictions of donors. And they represent themselves literally over time. And what, what this can possibly reveal about relative origins, um, cultural values, uh, gender differentiations, uh, religious history, and other issues of development. And finally, I hope, I hope to uh, get to the local uses of photography. Um, Zangskar uh, imagery goes back, uh, be, of course, not counting the petroglyphs, to uh, a, an early, uh, perhaps pre-Tibetanized um, uh, um, and, and oriented more towards Central Asia and Kashmir, um, that, that some, sometimes these, have, these are considered the oldest um, uh, images in uh, the Zangskar region, and they are I just point out that, that they're in this triangular niche right, right up here. And so the village itself is kind of built around um, these early images. And there's a depiction of a donor, uh, which you can see circled and on, on the right. Uh, a kneeling donor, very small compared to the other uh, bodhisattvas. And these have some, uh, in terms of the pose, the way that they're <coughs> dressed, can be connected to um, uh, Kashmiri-based <coughs> Balti uh, from, from Baltistan, an orientation that, that in the, the pre-Tibetan period, they were very much um, more involved with, um, with Kashmir. And, uh, uh, and that is clear also in some of, the, um, uh, some of the early paintings from a little bit later uh, than that, perhaps, where um, as at Alchi, they're dressed in uh, a type of clothes and they're, they're acting in a way that is, has much more in common with uh, Persianate uh, donors. Uh, so at least, in, I'm not suggesting that these were Persians at all or, or even necessarily Kashmiri, but the, the orientation culturally of the elites was uh, as much towards the West, immediate West, as it was towards, um, towards Lhasa at this time. Though over time, we, through looking at the the uh, patrons, we can see that that shifts. Um, another issue that, that comes up is, is um, so-called restoration, so-called development. Um, this, this kind of uh, very, uh, very pathetic and uh, due solely to, I suppose, well-meaning Westerners who um, sweep in and decide that, that they're um, able, uh, even on their first trip to Zangskar, they're able to know what is good for them. Uh, local people, and so they slap concrete and paint on the um, on these 11th century um, objects, which within just a few years um, are themselves falling apart. 
and we hope that they won't take the, the whole stupa with them when they do fall apart. Also, I mean, this is just so discouraging to see that they used a, a bucket in order to create the shape of a, of a finial, and then once the scarves uh, deteriorate, they're left with an upside down bucket on top of their stupa. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty sad. Um, but another issue that, that needs to be attended to, um, by the 12th century, there's, there's quite a bit of um, reorientation towards Tibet uh, rather than towards Kashmir. Um, though the depiction of the women is somewhat more stable uh, than, uh, and of course there's a, there's a big distinction between goddesses and the way that the, um, the female donors are, are depicted. Uh, it's, it's not the same. Uh, they're um, obviously an import from Kashmir on the part of the, the deities, but local um, uh, clothing traditions uh, for, for, the, for the donors. So for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead a little bit. Um, another example of uh, well-meaning uh, restoration. Um, uh, but uh, I want to spend a little, t a little time um, on the so-called Queen's Chorten, um, which is in Karsha, uh, one of the larger uh, places of, uh, of Zangskar, uh, which was added it's, uh, beneath a, a very um, old fort. And uh, there's a series of shrines around it. It's right across the defile from uh, the, the Champaling Monastery. Um, and up inside of it are a number of murals. And these murals um, on, on, on one side depict um, the first three Dalai Lamas, of course not named as Dalai Lamas, but it gives their actual names plus the first Ngadi Rinpoche. So there's a clear um, affiliation with, with the Gelupa. But on the opposite mural, there's a, uh, uh, an image of Re Chungpa uh, and uh, Milarepa and in fact the whole early stem lineage of the, of the Kagyu lineage. So in the same, um, the same small shrine, we have uh, both Kagyu and, and Geluk uh, lineages. And it seems that that is uh, because these were sponsored not by a monastery, not by uh, lineage uh, holders themselves, but by um, royal families who uh, supported both uh, simultaneously. Um, and speaking of, um, uh, we, we, can, we can sort of date it because of uh, the images of the donors, uh, which are depicted with some detail um, uh, at, the, at the bottom left of, of one of these murals uh, that show and actually name uh, the Gyalpos and the, uh, and the Queens. And we can sort of um, triangulate dates uh, through both the, the names as well as the styles. And you can see that the donors are uh, sharing a, a, a different kind of culture now that is uh, closely associated with the Ladakh Namgyal kings. Um, uh, I'll skip the stylistic issues um, and just go to, uh, there's also long inscriptions there at the same uh, uh, place that uh, name all of the people who were involved. And so it's not, it, it's mainly the elites, but it's also uh, the people who donated beer or, you know, uh, Chang, um, who, who, who worked on it. Um, and so although it's not, you know, restoring people to uh, social history exactly, it's still elites or at least the conception of the elites. Uh, there's a little bit more there than um, only, the, uh, only the names of the kings. Um, and the, the inscriptions also indicate that the queens were uh, heavily involved with every aspect of it, and that's why I've, I've sort of given it the name uh, Queen's Charton, and I'm, I'm sort of amused that that's been picked up locally, and so now they're calling it the Queen's Charton as well. Um, a number of kings uh, were depicted in there, a number of queens, but also what may perhaps be one of the earliest um, uh, self-portraits. Uh, the, the, uh, the artists are, are depicted, and named there, uh, like the Sherap. Uh, there are also a number of Lumpos, um, who are uh, sort of local headmen who are, who are named and indicated there. Uh, and I want to uh, focus on that and use that as a segue because the present day Karsha Lumpo um, uh, feels that these are, uh, among them must have been his, his ancestors. And so I, I want to turn now briefly to 
um, uh, something that, that, that David Zurich uh, addressed yesterday, uh, posed, uh, wonderfully introduced, um, the use of photography. Uh, and I, th I think that photography is um, an invaluable thing that we should be uh, attending to and studying because unlike the, um, the internet which tends to, um, uh, you know, doesn't leave a record of itself of the, of the, the rapid uh, changes, photography does. And there's much more uh, traces that can be attended to. Um, and so Karsha Lumpo uh, has shown me this photograph that is his the first photograph of him, uh, the first photograph of his family um, of, uh, that was done in the 60s, not in Zangskar. He had to travel to, to Leh to do it in the, in the 1960s, and this depicts his first son. He's a, he's a monk now, but um, th this is Tundam uh, Namgyal, uh, who's the, um, uh, the soon to be, the, uh, he calls himself the, the new Lumpo now. Um, uh, and, and this is Karsha Lumpo on, on, the, on the left. Um, these photographs were taken by, um, they seem to me to be the first photographs uh, that people experienced. Now these are small ID photographs. Uh, so the time when people were using them uh, to identify themselves for government offices or schools, uh, that, that's very interesting. And these have been uh, printed by a Zangskari. Uh, photographer who began working with a photographer in the 60s in Leh and uh, ha has still kept these, these, uh, the negatives for these. But much, much earlier photography, <coughs> this, is, this is recent, but uh, much, much earlier photography was used at a different register, not for ordinary people, but rather for um, uh, llamas. And of course today, uh, f photography we're all familiar with is used by artists in order to create certain kinds of, of very naturalistic uh, likenesses, such as uh, this image of the 19th Kushok Bakala, who, uh, who died in 2003. Um, but uh, using some old photographs, I was able to uh, get into uh, the, his uh, closed shrine, uh, the, his bedroom basically at Sankar Monastery, and there was a photographic image that was an old print, not a new print, of his predecessor, the 18th uh, Kushuk Bakala, uh, who died, I think, in 1917. So uh, he owns a number of photographs. And this particular photograph, he, he owns a version of it, or, or it's kept in the monastery, but it was assembled into an album in 1908. So it had to be photographed before 1908 of uh, the 18th Bakala. Uh, and using photographs, as, as uh, 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 Professor Zurich uh, pointed out, uh, it's such a prompt. If you bring old photographs, people are really, uh, really engaged with them, and they open uh, doors, they open uh, people's hearts. Uh, and by showing some old photographs, um, I was led, uh, mainly through Karsalumpo, to um, a family who owns on their shrine. They, when I showed them these photographs, they said, oh yeah, we have a, a photograph of the 18th Bakula. Um, on their family shrine, they had their, their ancestors had given him this white horse, and they had a photograph taken. So I think that, that photographs um, are really something that we need to attend to um, and realize that although they can be used for exoticization, kind of orient orientalization, um, they were also circulating uh, among uh, people and used in, in very different pur for very different purposes that if we, um, if, if we create uh, histories of um, uh, photography in Garhwal, uh, photography in, in Nepal, and Ladakh, and Spiti, um, we can actually contribute something very much in the way that Chris Pinney and um, uh, Strassler ha have done for uh, the larger world history of, of photography that's it's, it's very important because they're using these images in, in quite different ways than um, uh, people are and understand them to be used uh, in the West. Uh, and, you know, what, this is one example. Now, the 20th um, Bakala Rinpoche has been recognized, um, and the, this photograph of the child is installed. It's treated with kataks, uh, with, with uh, offered, offered reverence. And um, Karsha Lumpo 
uh, is here introducing himself to the new incarnation, reminding him of um, their previous lives uh, interactions. Um, and uh, since I was privileged to go along, I, I brought um, the child uh, f photographs of two, two predecessors back um, and gave them to him and he snatched them out of, out of my hand and, and was playing with them. Um, and so it'll be interesting to, to uh, once he grows up, to, uh, to find out what his attitude towards photographs of his own previous lives uh, might be. So I, I leave it at that. Uh, thank you. I want to start my talk with this night map of um, Asia. And you see Himalayas and the Tibetan plateau is dark. It's so contrast. And some ways this also reflects our sort of academic work. And we endlessly look towards uh, sinologists and people studying India and type of the works they do, like Peter Produce's work, you know. Can we do say, anything like that kind of work in t Tibet? Then um, the Himalayan area, Himalayan areas is sort of um, it's in, covered in dark, darkness. So this seems um, you know, two ways of illuminating this darkness. It's one is the the indigenous communities, uh, cultural production, literary and um, uh, visual uh, cultural productions that may illuminate this darkness. Or as we as scholars and academics um, working on the region uh, through our publications and research, you know, we can illuminate this uh, darkness. And um, some ways, uh, when we're looking at um, Tibet and the Himalayas, often I don't know how much of what we write and publish are really genuine reflection of what's happening on the ground, or is it just based on our own prejudice and our own preference than that. Now, to take this example, we know a great deal about Daebung uh, De um, or Kanden Monastery. You know, Daebung, we say there's 6,000 monks and we know the uh, names of the abbots of the monastery, we know the Kamzans, we know their literary productions, we know who's, who's teachers, a great deal about the scholastic production from the Kamsan monastery. Now imagine for me, Jebung had um, 6,000 monks, and imagine each monk require one kilo of um, um, fuel, fuel of energy for keeping warm and cooking, and that's usually done. So they need, that means they require 6,000 kilos of mm, dungs every day. Even that is the minimum use of energy fuel at that time. So you, in a week, that is 42,000 uh, kilograms of um, dung. And if you take that in a month, uh, in a month it would 1,660,000 kilograms of dung they need. So what do we know about the production of the tanks and how do they accumulate it? How are they collected, distributed? You know, we have no idea how do they sustain. What is the material condition that sustains the Tibetan civilization? You know, what are the material bases? And this was the question I think Charles and James Scott was trying to raise last night. So we have no clue about the material condition under which the Tibetan um, culture flourish. We can say that long distance trade, salt trade or tea trade, but really we don't ha know much about what is done. So that brings to, mis uh, to mind is, uh, is it that because of our own interest in sort of Buddhism and the philosophical traditions of Buddhism and different schools, is it that our research is uh, focused only on that and not interest in the material condition? Or is there inherent sort of um, conditions in Tibet that prevents us from doing any kind of work on this type. Say, can we write the economic history of Tibet? You know, there is not a single paper on e economy of 17th century Tibet or economy during the Tang period. We have no, no idea w w what were the conditions of economy on the middle surface on Tibet. So this and say, <laughs> some extent we can say, of course, it's not about our own prejudice which influence our research, but actually the material conditions in Tibet. You know, we don't have access to archives, we don't have the type of records that people working on Qing or Mughal India can get access to. 
the revenue records. You know, we ha in this and it's not available in Tibet, and so it's really hard. And so, at the same time, you know, ca uh, can we look at say, look at say Lama's Namdar in, in a different way instead of looking it as sort of spiritual finding out the lineages and spiritual history of a particular sect, but can we just say? If you study the number of Lamas Namdar in, say, the 14th century, can we find out about land ownership or land sales of land in, in Tibet? So, in forgetting about all the religion stuff, just look for the Namdar about um, land ownership. You know, I don't know in the 14th century, did Tibetans buy and sell land? And but sometimes in Namdar, you have some Lama says he's in a come and he's very poor and he wants to go to Tibet and he had to sell the land to go to Tibet, to, to Lhasa. And that's what brings to me, my God, in 1400, they were selling land. And how did they sell it? What was you know, the land was a commodity and it was economic commodity and exchanged and sold. So, some ways, <laughs> there are resources where we can. Uh, look at Tibet, but in certain ways we, it's our own prejudice. And um, one example I always give to my students and talk about is number of articles and books on the Jewish in China. You know, there's so many books and articles about Jewish, totally disproportionate to the actual number of Jews in China or their <laughs> significance in Chinese history. You know, they don't even deserve a footnote in Chinese history. And there isn't. I mean, I think Peter Bruce wrote uh, place a footnote in his massive book, China Marches Through. There's no footnote about Jewish in China. But there are so many books on the subject. But then we look at the Tibetan Buddhism penetrated China from the Tang period to the Tungku, to the Shisha Kingdom, and to the uh, uh, Yuan, Manchus, um, and Qing. You know, and deeply, deeply penetrated thing. And I came to where of the extent of the t uh, penetration of Tibetan Buddhism in Chinese uh, uh, tradition and culture is when I moved to Vancouver. And you go to um, all the Chinese te uh, temples in San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, everywhere on the gate there's a, uh, mantras written in Tibetan. Inside the temple walls all mantras are written in uh, Tibetan. And they have a Chaton Chendong, you know, the thousand arm eyes, Chinese in there, you know, one. And this is, when you look at the iconography, it's really it's Tibetan sort of uh, thing. So I just find so many ways that, and uh, this has showed me that actually the Chinese immigrants who came to here in 1900s, they also had to be linked with the Tibetan Buddhism in this way. So we don't have, say, or Tibetan Buddhism in China, except uh, um, Gray's uh, book deals with the 19th and early 20th century. But apart from that, we really don't have a sort of history of Tibetan Buddhism and its interchange with um, China. So, so I think then some extent it's our own prejudice which determines um, this uh, our own research. Mm. Now, if I want to go to now talk about the sort of literary and visual representation and the question some uh, Andrew and asked me to address. Um, when I used to travel to Nepal or to Ladakh and Tibet, and I used to, as I leave, I always leave about $100 or $150, say, to my friends and say, whenever you find a book, new books published, can you please send, post me a copy, a buy a copy for me and send it? And they used to do it very diligently, and I used to get maybe once every three months one book. But today, I cannot afford it to do. <laughs> That the number of book is just so many that I cannot ask them to send the books. And uh, they still send me books, and I don't even open them because there's books on the philosophy, books on the medicine, books on the astrology, books on science. You know, it's just, I just collect them, and, uh, but <laughs> don't, um, don't even have time to read. Because, and this is, in a way, a reflection, despite the sort of uh, uh, this Tibetan accusation of a uh, Tibetan language in the verse of destruction or disappearing. I would say in a way today that the uh, Tibetan literary, literary culture is really flourishing and it, you know, we're having a renaissance of Tibetan literature today, this very moment. Now, uh, one basis of that I would say is um, in today, in never in our history 
we had that large number of literate people. Today, with the literacy rate in Tibet, I'm at age 14 to 30, it's almost 75% in Tibetan. And that is you know, never, and type of people who are literate. In, in the past, so monks uh, or people, religious figures were literate, and very few lay aristocrats were uh, literate. Apart from the common, most of common people were illiterate. Even the umchis were illiterate because they usually l learn by uh, oral transmission uh, knowledge. But today we have an <coughs> entire body of secular, ordinary citizens who are, are literate. And there are, <laughs> and another sort of way I say that Renaissance is uh, looking at the number of books published in Tibetan language. It is really astonishing. And in Tibetan theological uh, circle, we, we, this has become sort of inside joke that Tibet has more writers than readers. You know, we produce <laughs> it's a unique situation. We publish so many books, but I don't know who reads them. And, that, but, um, and so today, number of books published is um, really fantastic. No, the publication consists of two literary work. One is reprinting of almost all texts. I would say uh, Palti Library and other sort of um, libraries in Lhasa, they more or less reprinted every sort of books that were published from the 8th century to present, being reproduced. And they produced, made it in sort of in a modern form and they distributed very easily. Because in past block print, books were really rare. You know, it could not be trouble. They have to carry on their back. And um, it's um, um, <coughs> people cannot go to shops to buy it. And you have to commission. You have to pay a lot of money to get someone to block print a copy for you. So <coughs> today with the technology, it's n n n uh, this n old books are distributed and people can possess it, own it. You know. In the past, um, Ordinary families, if they had uh, different types of getongba, you can, uh, getongba is another sort of textbook, uh, that is the sort of most uh, affordable collection they had. And they were allowed to have a little flag on their roof. But if they had a full set of kanjur, then they were allowed to have a darshi in front of their whole house. You know, that is in the house with uh, uh, but today, uh, they are buying these things and putting in their house. Almost everybody's uh, buying this, um, uh, uh, getting this modern, because it's really cheap and they can afford it. Um, so uh, this also has a publication of new uh, old books. Reprinting has ignited some of the debates uh, in philosophy, debates in religion, and debates. I mean, it's like. They're the books which you have not seen, uh, read by public since the uh, 14th century, are now suddenly being published. And then the, all the Buddhist monks are sort of debate that was left in 1400s are now being ignited in monasteries in South India and Lavrang, and they're debating and who publishing. And, and you go, my God, this is, yes, as to this gap has never happened, you know. And the real reason is that these books have been first time, they're seeing it for uh, themselves in this way. And secondly, <laughs> there's an amount of the lay people engaged in literary production. It is enormous. Everybody's writing their memoir. Everybody's writing their village history. You know, one of the things that I get requests from all the Tibetans from Tibet is, can you find a picture of my village? You know, they'll say, oh, um, I heard from my grandfather. There's some Westerner went through this village in 1920 or something, and he must have a photo. Can you please find this photo for me? That is so one of constant record that they're looking for. And another, really, now this stage, I would say, is uh, it's electronic for, uh, sort of production. And I say, in for the youth, Tibetan youth, I always say the iPhone saved the Tibetan language. Incredible <laughs> iPhone, really, really saved the Tibetan language. And it's uh, iPhones in t Tibet. People want them not because of prestige and uh, Apple's good but ease in which we can write Tibetan and send Tibetan text messages. <laughs> so everyone wants this. So, so the, this t technological availability <coughs> made it sort of everyone to use Tibetan. And, uh, and my son is in Lhasa now, and he says everybody just sort of chatting on uh, their uh, um, uh, 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 Twitters and everything. So it's a really incredible. Uh, literacy, vibrancy that is happening. And you know, it's really communicating in, in emails and uh, text messages.
This is incredible. It's never happened. So in this way, I said, in both in terms of use of the language itself, but in terms of production, I would say today now it's really a renaissance of that uh, Tibetan literary and creative culture is happening. Of course, then this is um, not to say then uh, the problem, but Tibet also faces a lot of problem. And the first time in our history, we are also faced to deal with hegemonic language. You have one level, in the, we have to deal with English, another side we have to deal with Chinese. So there are this great encouragement of this uh, hegemony. And when you talk to, to friends in Lhasa, no Tibetan in Lhasa can say the names of the days of the weeks in Tibetan. They say Xinji Yi, Xinji R, they only say day one, day two in Chinese. They cannot do. And another thing Tibetans cannot do is they count in Tibetan. They, they count uh, only in Chinese. They, if they found it, and I found it so frustrating when I'm on the phone with them and they have to give me address or they have to give me a, a telephone number, and they cannot do it in Tibetan. So they, they just lost this counting system. They just can go up to 10, and that's, they cannot go beyond it. And they can only now count in Chinese. And also the method of counting, we say 10,000, we say T, and boom is 100,000. Um, 100, so they say 10,000 10, for 100,000. They don't say boom. They don't even know this boom. And the days of week, that has been. So there's increasing challenge uh, uh, Tibetan literacy and the faces, literature faces, is that the encroachment. So that's why, in terms of our literary production, there are um, three sort of um, languages people are producing. You have the Dev Tibetan diaspora writing in English, and the Tibetans in Tibet writing both in English and Chinese. And that there's sort of constant debate among the Tibetans is now, what is Tibetan literature? You know, do you define it in terms of ethnicity, or do you define it in terms of uh, language use? And 2004, when I was in Lhasa doing sort of meeting with the, uh, contemporary writers, and I was leaving, I decided I want to host a party. Then I invited the, all the Tibetans writing in Chinese and Tibetan writing in Tibetan. And one of the Tibetans writing in Tibetan said, if those Chinese come, we are not coming to your party. <laughs> <laughs> they are not a Tibetan writer. <laughs> they said. But I said, what they think? But they don't write in Tibetan, so they're not a Tibetan writer. If you ever write an article calling them Tibetan writer, they said, they're not going to talk to me. <laughs> so there's, uh, uh, and, and literally, I could not hold a joint party because uh, there was a, such a, uh, a sharp dislike, and it's about who represents who. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big problem. And if you look and say, China, there's an award for minority literature, literary prizes. And it's always given to uh, Tibetan writing in Chinese. So Tibetan language writers that never get this award or elected to these prestigious positions in, in uh, literary institutions. So it's uh, only those who are writing in Chinese. So the Tibetans in Lhasa or in Amdo are so upset because uh, all the attention and the fame is uh, loaded on those who are writing in Chinese. And of course, this is not just a Tibetan situation, you know. I mean, what are people writing in Hindi or in Gujarati? You know, when in the West we just think of uh, Indian literature, we think of some Rusty and all those who great writers who write in English. They don't know about people writing in, in indigenous language, or Urdu or Hindi. The way few people that these are translated. So Tibetans also face the same problem now: is that the lack of exposure and attention from the, the, the hegemonic powers on that. So when the Chinese. <laughs> um, tend to see Tibetan literature as literature written by Tibetan in Chinese. And um, they don't l see the sort of the language you know, or, or that Tibetans are using. So this is one of the main sort of co contestation and angers uh, um, uh, in uh, Tibet that's happened. And, but um, another interesting thing that I call that there has been uh, a great sort of literary renaissance because I call this sort of the collapse of dominance of Buddhism. You know, Buddhist hegemony is gone in Tibet. Now people can write anything uh, th they want. Uh, subject matter has totally changed. You have novels, you have poetry, everything. So, yeah. um, and uh, one of the way, way people really participating is Tibetan bloggers and writings on internet. It's just amazingly vibrant internet uh, forum that exists in Tibetan language. And uh, I, I sometimes 
look at these blogs and understand, and then anthropologists coming back and writing about Tibet. This is a totally different report. The, what the Tibetans are debating and what anthropologists say is happening is totally different from what they're d debating. Now, uh, nobody has written about this uh, in Amdo. There's a big fight going on in Amdo. There is a Gechu, uh, uh, Gechu, Gechu, Gechu. it's a ten virtues being promoted by, I forgot the name of the Lama, has been promoted where they're supposed not to steal, not to be adulterous, not to make a profit, not to cheat. There's a ten virtues, and every Tibetan is supposed to adopt this. And these monasteries and the monks are going from household to household in Amda and come, say, people to knock it, swear oath on observing this Gewachu. And they are forcing people. So then Janki, another Tibetan blogger, wrote attack on, said, this is a Taliban, you know, they are, this is we are forcing. <laughs> and she's a feminist. And uh, she just wrote this attack and said, you're forcing and uh, you're abandoning people to... Uh, uh, don't do business. They have, people, shopkeepers have to their sh sell their shops. You know, that's going on. But no anthropologist ever reported this uh, 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 sort of vibrant debate that's happening there. And it's a huge uh, exchange that's happening. Similarly, in the blogs about the uh, in really attacks on uh, lamas and reincarnation system, it's a vibrant sort of debate that is now happening in blogosphere. And uh, sort of visually, of course, you all heard of um, Bema Tsetan. You know, now the Tibetans are wi winning international film awards. And that's really interesting. And their subject matter and what they tell is really very uh, Tibetan emotionally. And Bema Tsetan's um, work <laughs> is um, on Old Dog. That was really amazingly uh, uh, accurate description of what's happening in, the, in Tibet. So just to finish, I'll summarize things. Uh, there's a two tropes in which Tibetans debate contemporary things. And uh, one is Rigne Sumke, so preserving the tradition. Or other side is Rigne Sarte, you know, creating a new culture. So this is the two things. And you have the uh, um, Tibetan diaspora, they tend to talk about Rigne Sumke preserving, but the Tibetans in Tibet, they talk about Rigne Sarte. But when they mean new, creating new, they're concerned with the very mundane things, you know. How, how, how can we have a dictionary of technology? How can we t turn, uh, translate modern contemporary terminologies into Tibetan? You know, how should we translate? Do we with or kukyur? You know, how, what kind of sort of method we should? There's really this kind. This is they see that's a creation, not in some that way. And the others are talking about why can't we make films? You know, why can't we make televisions? Uh, so there's a, when Tibetans they say ring this up, they don't mean they don't want to destroy the all. But they want to, uh, what they call it, um, catching up with the rest of the society and using like iPhone for Tibetan. That is a ringne sardu. They said that the bell make, unless we make Tibetan language completely integrated with the modern technology and system, our language will be destroyed. We, when our language is completely integrated with the modern technology, it will be used. Like where iPhone has integrated Tibetan language, that made it possible of us to. Uh, communicate in Tibetan and send text messages without sort of um, I, uh, Apple making that technology available, you know, we would have to shift to ch uh, Chinese or English. So iPhone saved Tibetan language. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for um, uh, a series of talks that um, have left me uh, on the one hand, fascinated and interested, and on the other, I feel like I've been climbing, rock climbing, and I'm up pretty high, and the rope has fallen away. I don't know how I'm going to weave um, together uh, some comments for you. So let me just start um, on a personal level, because I think that at least has linked the, uh, the uh, interesting uh, talks we've heard this morning. Um, I suffer from the Shangri-La syndrome, and I won't pretend that I, I don't continue to do that. My interest in uh, Tibet and uh, the Himalayan region began uh, fundamentally as a teenager, the love affair with um, the arts and what I could learn of, of the Buddhism. Um, nonetheless, I went on to a career working in Japanese Buddhism, um, Buddhist art in particular, uh, and yet, um, I find myself in recent years back to where I started. 
with an interest in the iconographical and stylistic and ritual or practical uh, connections that lead uh, me from 11th and 12th and 13th century Japan back to uh, Western Tibet and the Himalayan region more broadly considered. So um, this entire way of thinking for me is posited on uh, what Rob just mentioned as circuits of exchange, um, of the multiple connections that, are, that can occur over uh, rather enormous and sometimes unlikely uh, uh, geographical and chronological uh, expanses. So that's kind of the direction I'd like to take and um, the few comments that I have here uh, as I'm mindful of our time um, as well. Um, it seems to me that whether we're talking about um, the 10th and 11th centuries or we're talking about today, um, the, the sense when we consider circuits of exchange, self-representation seems to be a really critical aspect of the ways in which um, people face-to-face uh, -face encounter both cultural difference and cultural um, similarities, however we might want to define those terms. Uh, where the local, for instance, meets um, the global, global interests um, and local uh, specific specificities. Um, and it's a long, to me, this is the most interesting area of much of the um, discussions that we've heard, where the sort of, there's a shifting and jostling of um, connections that one might um, not always expect to um, encounter. So this has led me around to thinking um, in two ways. I kind of have uh, a macro question and a, a micro one, um, because I tend to think in um, images uh, as an art historian. Um, I was wondering how we, I mean, I've, I've heard people talking about this Himalayan region seems to be an entity that is one way or another connected. Um, I'm, I'm, wondered, I'm wondering if um, the panelists and others can help me uh, conceptualize or imagine um, the model that we that's being used to talk about this, this space, this region, this system of connections. Um, uh, how do we, cons what, how, do I, how can I imagine it? That's a, 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 I seriously want to ask this question because it pertains to my own selfish um, uh, goal and projects that I'm involved in right now. Um, are we thinking about this particular, let's say we say Himal Himalayan region, Himalayan cultures, uh, Himalayan studies. Are we talking about a series of uh, specific uh, areas that are images of a larger whole, like in a fractal sense maybe? Or is this a system of uh, integrated, like a web, Indra's web, a series of uh, sort of nodes along a great uh, net that connects everything together? Um, I'm very curious about this issue because I, I'm struggling with this. I want to know what does this mean because we, from the talks today and everything I heard yesterday, we're really talking a lot of, about a very, a, a large number of very local specificities that are uh, brought together in this big uh, notion of a grand, on the grand scale, um, Himalayan region. Um, on the micro level, I'm thinking of Lobsang's uh, cap. We were, uh, Rob showed that a moment ago, um, where um, I'm, I'm wondering in what ways our scholarly and personal interests in these specific areas leave a footprint um, that should then be uh, perhaps uh, wrapped into the larger uh, notion of uh, circuits of exchange and the push and pull um, along the circuitry where self-representation I think is, is quite critical. Um, what do we have to offer um, on the macro and the micro uh, levels? Um, like I said, I'm a visual person. I don't necessarily think in text, so um, I'm again trying to conceptualize what this what this is. Um, uh, what kind of place is Himalayan uh, region and Himalayan studies for any given locality uh, within it? I have a ingrown uh, resistance to sort of models that encompass everything into one singularity. So. Um, that's fundamentally uh, the question I have. By talking about this uh, very broad region um, as if it's one uh, network or unitary uh, entity, 
um, are we ourselves uh, somehow uh, adding something to the conversation that might not actually um, necessarily be useful? Um, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just wondering about this question because it's <laughs> related exactly to something I'm working on right now, and I cannot. I'm obsessed with this issue, um, and so I ask. I think it's come up repeatedly in the uh, discussions we've had today already this morning, and it will continue to come up. I think I've heard it yesterday. All of us are ultimately asking something very similar, and. Um, Personally, I need help figuring this out. And um, there's, uh, I think, a rather exhilarating possibility involved in conceptualizing a model um, uh, for how you bring together such incredibly diverse cultural zones um, and make them work together as a group without losing that specificity. Uh, so that's my comment for today and my question. Thank you. Well, let's open things up to questions. Yes. Uh, I think uh, the last comment is really, uh, maybe the last comment is really very pertinent. I hope uh, there can be some discussion of that. But I just first wanted to endorse, uh, I think, Michael's and uh, Sally's <coughs> call which we have heard before, too, during the last couple of days, of enhanced connectivity, since we are talking about Himalaya connections, enhanced connectivity between Himalayan studies and contemporary issues, whether they relate to environment, culture, history, languages. And I think it's a very, very appropriate reminder on the last day. Second, I have a question from Michael, and that is, I think I was fascinated by your intriguing account on the modern literature on culture and conflict. And the question is, to what extent that can be isolated from similar literature that might be appearing in the neighboring parts of India and in the region in general? because we have many common elements uh, apart from uh, religion, uh, ethnicity, and political movement. And furthermore, when we keep into account what is driving and accentu accentuating some of these conflicts in the political economy of the region, Um, can I answer? Can I, can I answer both? Actually, I'm quite in, some, some just the thoughts on on Mimi's very interesting questions about whether there is an entity called Himalayan Studies, and, and or whether it's just a, a kind of a you know, we, we've drawn a, a line around a part of the of the Earth's surface and and, and defined ourselves in those. I think of it as there being a number of kind of overlapping scholarly communities, perhaps, and. Um, but maybe one can define them in terms of the, uh, in, perhaps one way of defining them would be in terms of language. Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a scholarly community whose starting point is is stuff stuff in Tibetan, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then there's within that subdivisions of s subdivisions within that of of people who are using Tibetan for you know Buddhist textual analysis, and and then the anthropologists who are using it as a as a, as, a, as a spoken language for interview and then the kinds of things that Sering's talking about the blogging and so on um, and then there's the Nepali focal point um, and there are others too um, but they do interact with each other I mean for if, if one if one's if one's sort of focal point is like my own is perhaps primarily Kathmandu mm -hmm. there is also that other world there the Tibetan sort of sphere overlapping, even though maybe it's seen as rather marginal. From the Tibetan point of, point of view, perhaps the Nepal is, is rather more marginal. But there is a relationship between them, and they do coexist within within a certain space. Um, on the, the question of the relationship between Nepali writing and writing in, in other South Asian languages and so on, there's a very close and historic relationship, particularly with writing in Hindi, 
Um, but I would say what's perhaps most interesting at the moment is the way in which, something I haven't mentioned, is the way in which a number of Nepali writers who are writing in English are achieving a profile, a, a wider profile outside, outside of Nepal because this stuff is, is written, the literature written in Nepali is written for a Nepali readership and it's based on an assumption, a lot of assumptions of the readership's understanding. Um, if one is writing for a wider readership, a lot of that needs to be sort of sketched in uh, for an international readership. But people like Manjushri Thapa, Samratu Padhyay, um, and people, newcomers like Prajwal, Parajuli, that they are beginning to appear at the Jaipur Literature Festival. There is a relationship developing sort of internationally between those writers as well. Um, they will tend to deal less with conflict than people writing in Nepali itself. Um, but yet, there, there is some, some, some equivalence to I agree, and I enjoyed Mimi's comments, particularly on two reasons. Uh, one is this emphasis on the visual, and I think that we see a certain visual continuity in the culture of the Himalaya uh, for any number of reasons, but also it, it not only shows a very strong Buddhist and uh, Tibetan influence in many ways, but it shows influence from many other regions. You know, we certainly see the Western influence, uh, and we see this textually also, particularly in Bunpo literature, but you really do see a coming together of many things. The other is this whole question of what do we share as students of this world area. And using a geographic term is in some ways as good as anything, uh, partly because many of us have been uh, associated with departments or programs that tried to somehow encapsulate what it is that actually we all share an interest in, but they call it different things, from High Asia to Central Asia to Inner Asia to, uh, you know, the Tibeto-Burman world or whatever. And it, it's a very difficult thing to look at. I'm curious as to how the native people view this, and also particularly the question of nation. You know, do we have a sense of local identity and national identity, and is that rather new or not? And I think that's an area we need to study a lot more of. Uh, other comments? Yes. Uh, Mike, a question. Uh, in the five novels, uh, it, it seems they are the top five circulated novels during the period, no? Uh, more or less. More or less. More or less. So, and all of those are written by male Bahuns. Not only Brahmins, but male Bahuns. Yeah. Bahuns and yeah. so on. So I was wondering, uh, what was uh, your thoughts on, uh, what could be the reason behind only male Bahuns, who are around 6-7% of the population, doing so well? Mm. Uh, so, so that's your thoughts on that. One, one newish feature of this whole thing is the way in which um, journalism and literature have come closer together. So if we look at the uh, uh, three or four of those five, um, they're all, they've all had, prior to publishing their novels, um, a profile nationally as, as a columnist or a journalist. Yuk Patak writes political pieces, uh, and then I Wagner obviously was the editor of Kantipur and so on. So I think that the kind of, the the way in which male bones get to the top of the pile in, in areas like journalism has, has translated itself into the literature sphere as well. But it, I mean, it always, it always has been male bones and male, male higher caste newars that, um, that have dominated Nepali writing. I mean, there is, there is a, as you know, there is also an increasing um, production of writings in Nepali by, by people from Adivasi Janajati uh, backgrounds. I mean, the, 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 this new novel by um, is it Rajan Mukharun, and then the poetry by Shravan Mukharun. Um, um, I think, is it Rajan Mukharun? Rajan and Shravan Mukharun. These are, I mean, these are, these are, I'm currently reading those actually, but I, I haven't included them in this one because they, they seem not to have the same level of circulation, or at least they haven't had up, up until now. They're fairly new. But we are, we are. What I'm, the point I was making was that even though these are written by Bowen males, they still are incorporating a lot of, of different perspectives. So you, you can see that they're writing in an environment where perhaps there's a sense that the, the old kind of Kathmandu-centric assumptions of Nepali society can no longer be replicated 
in the writings even of Bowen Males was the point I was kind of trying to make. But it, that isn't to say that there aren't Janajati writers uh, beginning to emerge as well. More in poetry, I think, at the moment than in, than in novels as, as such. Andy. So uh, picking up on, on Mimi's idea of uh, circulation uh, of ideas, I wonder what the, the authors that, uh, that Mike has discussed would have to say in conversation with the writers that Sering has discussed. And by that I mean, to what extent are they facing similar issues? Are they writing about similar uh, ideas? Are they writing against similar kinds of ideas? Firstly, just some um, the sort of connection in Himalaya. It's sort of quite uh, interesting. Um, there's quite a little meeting uh, interaction between uh, people from um, Nepali areas to Tibetan areas. And today, most of people are sort of bilingual. They speak Tibetan, Nepali. Most of my niece and nephews and everyone, you know, they are bilingual totally. They're, they're, they're. And um, another thing is. Uh, uh, of the centuries of Nepal Tibetan, we don't even have Nepali Tibetan dictionary, you know. And um, there's Finnish Tibetan dictionary. I don't know how many people require that. But, uh, <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no Nepali Tibetan dictionary. Yeah, and no one has produced one. Is is this because there's no need for one, or the, it re reflects the level of interaction? There is no sort of literary interaction or intellectual interaction. It's almost of a trade or commerce that links the people of Himalayas and not the sort of the intellectual discussion that's yeah. happening. Yeah. So, of course, the subject matters. At yesterday, when people were talking, I thought I'm really the him truly Himalayan uh, person because if I look at my sort of answers, my kinship and my family, I mean, we are Tibetan, we are Newari, we are Gurung, we are from Sikkim, we are from Bhutan. I have relatives everywhere. Going <laughs> there. And they all, uh, uh, we are so promiscuous, we don't have hesitation of marrying anybody. You know, and uh, my uh, um, relatives are married to Gurungs, they're married to Tamangs, they're married to Lepchas. And it, it's mingling of that um, thing. entire sort of Himalayan belt, I have relatives. So I think, in some sense, really, we've become sort of truly Himalayan. Uh, family in that way. But it, it, in terms of subject matter, it's very different because the two influences are very different. That They deal with, um, I don't know whether Nepal, they've, the Nepali sort of writers, so they're feeling that they're writing on the verge of when, when the, their culture is under attack, they're under threatened. No. But the Tibetans, so almost all are writing with this sense that their uh, culture is under attack and that they threat, their identities and virtue to disappear. So that is constant. When you ask any Tibetan writer, why do you write? They say, for safe Tibetan language, mm -hmm. you know, that they're writing. Mm -hmm. that's the you don't have, that's not the case with Nepal, <coughs> you know. And I think but in the, these are very different <coughs> social and political spheres as well. I don't think there's a great deal of, 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 of consumption by, by one by the other, I mean, at least if we're talking about the kind of Tibetan plateau as a geographical area, I don't, I don't imagine there's a great circulation of, of writings in Nepali there and vice versa. Oh well, yeah, I mean, only they, they, um, they translated uh, your Munamatan. Uh, Munamatan, they've got it written in Nepali and translated English. Through English, it was translated into Tibetan. <coughs> the reason it was translated into Tibetan was uh, some Nepalese prime minister was visiting Tibet, and the Chinese thought they have to present something to him, and they got my friends at the Academy of Social Science to translate it. And they wrote, asked me, said, they, we have to translate the Nepali into Tibetan. What can we find? So I said, I only know Michael's translation. <laughs> 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 so it's not Munamatan wasn't even saying because they thought it was the most important Nepali literature. It was the only thing I knew. <laughs> there was also been I was very fortunate to meet the, the translator of Munamatan into Chinese also in, in New York and it turned out he'd also used my English translation of Munamatan rather than the original Nepali. Um, so you wonder what 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 what's what's being lost as it goes and where it's going to end, you know? Talking about circulation. Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you look at television news footage in Tibet, when a Nepali leader visits Tibet, and they have those very very orchestrated ritualistic meetings on television, sitting either side of a flower pot with a picture of the Pitaba behind, you find that you will only ever see with a Nepali official 
visiting a Chinese official there, there's only one interpreter, and he's sitting behind the Chinese, because the Nepalis don't bring a Tibetan interpreter with them. So they entirely rely on the Chinese, which is a way of signaling very low level of resources and knowledge of the language. It's quite, quite a serious issue. Mm. So they have to rely on the Chinese translator. I have two questions. Um, no, no, go ahead. Um, one is to Michael about the, the uh, and maybe this is a, a, a nod to some of uh, Sarah's concerns, the, the, um, the economics of publishing novels mm. in the fall. Are uh, these self-published? Is it, you know, that also possibly also explain who's publishing and so on. Um, and the other, the other one <coughs> is to Rob. Uh, I really appreciate looking at the donors and all of these things. Again, it's an it's uh, uh, interesting way of, of reading against the usual interpretation for lineage and, and iconography and, and things like that, but to look at the, the clothing and the, the situation and the... Uh, do you think, do you have any reason to think that the portrayal of donors um, is more <coughs> realistic? I mean, is more realistic. In other words, can we really read social history out of the portrayal of those donors? Do you think? So, uh, Please, uh, yeah. sure. Uh, well, of course, uh, there is uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, projected, you know, the, the donors are going to be uh, portrayed in the way that they wish to be portrayed, mm -hmm. uh, as, they, as they hope to be, rather than necessarily as as they are, but I, I do think that they uh, play roles, that the role is as much being uh, portrayed as the individual person, uh, and in that way, um, the, the social role is not really accurately. <coughs> well, I just want to specifically, like, for instance, were there perhaps more references to um, uh, Persian kingship and, and Persian patronage styles than might actually have been found? Uh, in the, in, I mean, would there se is it possible that their self-representation would have partly come out of a really different um, uh, political economy than the one that they did? I think in the early period, that, that's very true, that in terms of the material um, culture of kingship, um, the, the kinds of uh, textiles that were required um, were Persian and the uh, the other images of kingship um, were those of the Sakyans, uh, certainly, that, that seemed to have circulated. So uh, whether or not that they were 100% they were accurate, they, they were sort of aspirational portraits. I hope we'll all notice the portrait of Henry Luce in the <laughs> gathering area outside who <laughs> endowed the building. But, uh, it, on, on the economics of publishing, yeah. um, it's, it's very interesting the way it's changed, um, and it's a much more commercial operation. Sorry, sorry, Robbie. It, much more commercial operation than it was 20 years ago. So, until until the 90s, I guess um, the main publisher was Sarja Prakashan, which was basically a government subsidiary, and but only one of those novels was published by Sarja now. And they, these are, are small private publishers by and large, and they are they are making profits. This is a commercial operation that is marketed and the sales are much, much larger than anything that went before. Um, like, like, yeah. like the Tibetan sphere, I suppose, you know, we've got, you know, much, if you look at literacy in Nepal, the number of literate people has doubled every 10 years in the last 30 years or so. So the, 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 the market is there that wasn't there perhaps even 10 years ago. Maybe last, last question, please, Carol. Yes, um, Please. actually before I ask the question, just a comment mm -hmm. on the, um, uh, the Persian style. Um, I mean David probably knows the reference better than I do. In one of the trillions, uh, there's a reference to uh, the penultimate emperor, uh, Rao Pa Chen, um, meeting uh, Chinese delegates, I think, and there's a, a, a very fine description of him um, wearing uh, silk brocade and uh, a, t um, a silk turban the color of dawn. And it was very clear that he was wearing um, um, it, it, the actual question I wanted to ask you was about the, um, the veterinarian manual uh, on horse doctrine. Um, is, is there just one that you know of, or did you know anything about uh, 
the content and the origin? I, I believe I, I found it on um, on uh, PBRC, right. uh, so that it exists other than this uh, manuscript. Right. But uh, uh, it's the only illustrated one I've right. heard of. Yeah, because there is one from the Muslim actually, which is illustrated. Yeah. It belongs to the you know, the ex king. There's a book on the philosophy. Really? Yeah, I think part of the book is about horse horse text right. and how you tell from the teeth and yeah. other things. Sure. Is it illustrated? I've only seen a discussion of it in one of the textbooks. It's a series of texts. I didn't plan to end a discussion on horses. I'm always accused of <laughs> having too much enthusiasm for the British Art Center because I actually like the Stubbs horses there. But um, that, I think, wraps it up for now, and we'll be adjourning for a short break.